Hello, good afternoon everybody or good morning depending on where you are. I, my name is Claudia Keller. I am the Quality Risk Analyst at Clinarian in Basel and today I am the organizer of this web meeting. I'd like to welcome everybody to our webinar today which is called Are you prepared for the new ICH GCP addendum? I hope that everybody can see my screen. Um, what you can see now is a brief overview of what you can expect today. Um, we have basically two parts. Part number one, there will be speaker Dr. Peter Schiemann who is talking about the implications of the ICH E6 amendment on actually managing clinical trials. Peter is a renowned expert in research and development strategy, clinical development, risk, quality, and project management. He is also a managing partner at Wiedler and Schiemann Limited, a consulting firm focusing on all aspects of clinical development, from protocol quality by design to study setup, project management, and risk-based oversight of clinical trials, such as risk-based monitoring, before founding Wiedler and Schiemann Limited, he worked at Roche in several functions, at PricewaterhouseCoopers in research and development strategy consulting, and in academic research. Dr. Schiemann is member of the European Forum for Good Clinical Practice, and their working parties like Patients' Roadmap to Treatment and Medical Technology, and also the Research Quality Association. Feel free to view his profile also on LinkedIn. So after that, you will hear Randy Ramin Wright talking about risk-based study oversight, which is supported by the Quality Risk Radar. The um, Quality Risk Radar is our clinarium tool supporting risk-based study oversight. Randy is a clinical quality risk management consultant and solution provider. He is the head of quality risk management at Clinarium and is responsible for the business development of its quality risk management products and services. Randy holds a Master of Science in Physics and has more than 20 years experience in consulting risk management and implementing information management systems. He is an active member of the Alliance for Clinical Research Excellence and Safety, also known as ACRES where he promotes the establishment of standardized clinical quality services. Further information about Randy and his career can also be found in his LinkedIn profile. So, having said this, I think we're almost ready to start. Um, if you have questions during the show, please enter your questions into the little chat box on the right side of your screen. The chat box is in under the title chat, so everybody should be ready to find this. By the end of this meeting, uh, we will come back to your questions and give you the corresponding answers. So, and before we uh, finish the webinar, there will also be a section uh, about how to get started with the quality risk radar that will be introduced to you by Randy, as well as an outlook on the upcoming events. All right, I think that we are ready to go. And I pass over to Peter. Thank you very much, Claudia. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear me all right. Um, I was uh, really pleased to see so many uh, names that I know from uh, the past years and uh, welcome to this webinar. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the ICH6 addendum um, and what it means for our clinical development basically um, and uh, I would like to offer now because um, there might not be enough time to answer questions and you might come up with questions after the webinar is over. Um, you will, 
I think we see this presentation first and secondly I will also be available for questions at some point in time later um, during the week or next week or whatever you feel like it. Now to start Claudia please the next slide. Thank you. Now um, I think you and that is what I um, uh, assume um, that you all know ICH E6 more or less by heart. Uh, you know what it says, you know how it's um, basically structured. And I think what is interesting is that the new ICH, or basically what the addendum is saying and what has been entered into the uh, current one, has like six areas of focus I'd like to stress. Um, there are some minor others um, which I leave out for the moment, but I think those six are the most important ones. First, um, there is increased emphasis on investigator responsibilities, and I think that is very interesting. I'll come to that in a minute. Then they have added a complete chapter on risk-based quality on a risk-based quality management system. Um, which, and uh, those of you who know me, um, I've been predicting that since quite some time, that this will be coming and become um, part of our daily business. Then there is um, additional um, paragraphs on outsourcing and oversight, which is very interesting. And um, of course, um, based on the, the recent developments and the developments over the past years, a very strong emphasis on risk-based monitoring. Um, I also think that it is important to mention that they uh, stress in a, an, an additional paragraph the root cause analysis need. And last but not least, there is further clarification on electronic records and essential documents. And I'll briefly go into that as well. So please the next slide. Thank you. So why did they actually um, create this addendum? Because I think, in my opinion, ICAG 6 was actually quite a good um, guideline for clinical research, uh, GCP, and for the protection of human subjects and the integrity of the data. But I think um, when you read those lines, uh, I've um, highlighted a bit those areas I think uh, which are important. That through the, the recent uh, developments in technology, risk management procedures, and all the initiatives that have been ongoing, that there are new opportunities to increase efficiency and focus. I completely agree with that. But I think the second paragraph is even more important. And there, the second line you see here. So that now we are in a position to have more efficient approach to clinical trial design, conduct, oversight, recording, and reporting. And that is a very important sentence. And you see those lines here in quotation marks, so those are copied directly out of the addendum. Um, this is, I think, one of the most important sentences in this new addendum. And I'll show you why in the next slides. Next slide, please. Now, what are the implications? I was already telling you about the six areas I'd like to go, go um, little, you know, focus on and, and emphasize. First, the investigator responsibilities. Of course, we know the investigator has certain responsibilities, also according to the quote-unquote old ICH E6. However, um, here they've added sentences that are basically um, even increasing that responsibilities if you could. And you see this again in quotation marks, so this is directly uh, copied from the text. And I think it's very important to see that it says, you know, the investigator is responsible for supervising any individual or party to whom the investigator delegates study tasks. And those of you who have been a monitor or are a monitor or have been working in that area, know very well that investigators very often, well, I shouldn't say abuse, but um, delegate tasks to the monitor uh, that actually are theirs. For example, getting their filing in order, etc. Um, so here, um, 
this sentence applies to that, um, funnily enough. And the second one is even more important because it says if the investigator or institution retains the service of any party to perform such tasks, they should ensure this party is qualified. And I think that is another sentence that is important, especially um, here it was in the past not so clear that this is the investigator responsibility. Uh, it was always, you know, said, okay, the sponsor needs to make sure that the site staff is adequately trained and, and needs to make sure they have procedures and so on and so forth. Here, um, those two sentences basically shift more responsibility to the investigator. Very important piece. Next slide, please. And I'm coming to that uh, again um, later. The risk-based quality management system. Um, it's not surprising that we find this new chapter. It's, it's really a new chapter in ICD-6. And um, it is basically structured into uh, those categories you find here, critical process data identification, risk identification, evaluation, control, communication review, and reporting. And when you look at what is described in the addendum, it's basically nothing else what um, was formerly in the Australian New Zealand Standard of Risk Management, which over the last years became ISO 31000. So basically what they have put in for a quality management system is basically uh, the generic risk management procedure. And this is very important uh, especially the sentence I've copied here again, sponsors should implement a system to manage quality throughout the design, conduct, recording, evaluation, reporting, and archiving of clinical trials. So basically, they, um, with this addendum, they require a, a quality management system in place that is based on a risk-based approach. And um, basically kind of reflects what the EMA has also uh, written in their reflection paper. Next slide, please. Then there is um, one very interesting, uh, two interesting uh, sentences on CRO and oversight. Um, and I think you know, those of you who work in uh, QA uh, are familiar with inspections and audits, um, probably know that over the past years, the majority of the findings in inspections and audits have been lack of oversight or issues with oversight um, regarding CROs, third parties working on behalf of the sponsor. And here they added two sentences that are actually um, increasing that requirement. So any trial-related duties, and I think the second one is even more important because in the past it has happened very often that um, CROs, um, for example, when they did those tasks there without knowing really of it very often, here now this requires the sponsor to approve any subcontracting of tribal related duties and functions. And that is very important too. Next slide, please. Now, we come to the slides that you've been all been waiting for, I guess, the most important one, the most interesting ones, and here I've done three slides on that one. Um, they clearly say the sponsor should develop a systematic priority of this based approach to monitoring clinical trials, and they also say a combination of on-site and centralized monitoring activities may be appropriate. <clears throat> However, they do not specify and keep it quite open. Um, also, there are can be steps in between. Next slide, please. Yes. So I think what is important, uh, they also put in um, paragraphs on risk-based monitoring what shall be done, basically. So there needs to be a routine review of submitted data. Then there is a whole paragraph on data quality. I call the data quality. So it's basically about uh, data discrepancies, uh, if you want uh, to call it that. Missing data, inconsistencies, outliers, etc. They also require statistical analyses to identify data trends uh, as a range and consistency. 
across all sides. Um, and I think the, the last but one is very important. We also want to see metrics in place, be it risk metrics, be it performance metrics. Um, that is really something that is important in this sense. And um, the selection of sites, there should, needs to be a process for targeted on-site monitoring. And what this means comes in the next slide, please. Yes. So that needs to be reflected in the so-called monitoring plan. And this is also a uh, quote from the uh, addendum. You see here that they require the sponsor to develop a monitoring plan, which is nothing new. You know, we've done that in the past. However, it should describe a monitoring strategy, the responsibilities of all parties involved, the methods, and I think what is most important, that's why I underlined it, the rationale for their use. So basically, when you employ a risk-based approach, they want to know why you have done certain things, and you need to give a rationale. You also need to give a rationale for the actions that you then uh, deploy based on the risks you've identified. So here we're looking at a complete turnaround of monitoring strategy, basically with the risk-based monitoring to have a plan in place, and the plan basically would be your risk assessment where you would do an assessment of the current situation and the future situation while going along with your trial, and then certain activities should result out of your risk assessment, and those activities need to be consistent. That's why they're asking for a rationale. The second part is, of course, also important. Um, emphasize the monitoring of critical data and processes, of course, and those especially that are not routine. Those would pop up in your risk assessment anyway if you have non-routine uh, clinical practice procedures. Of course, they require additional training. There's the chance quite higher of failure. And the monitoring plan should reference the applicable policies and procedures that you have established at your company. Um, so this is quite a bombshell, I think, amongst um, all sponsors of clinical trials. Um, they're just a few sentences, but they demand a lot, as you can imagine. Next slide, please. And last but not least, I'd like to uh, say a word about um, basically records. Here we talk about documentation. So they've uh, clarified some parts on the documentation. Um, it is very important um, to maintain adequate and accurate source documents. And you'd like to come to the investigator, back to the investigator, because it says the investigator should maintain adequate and accurate source documents. And when you think about the first slide where I said, you know, sometimes the investigator has had delegated um, tasks to the monitor, here it is actually, they, the, this ICH addendum asks the investigator to ensure the accuracy of their source documents, not the monitor. So, and as we know, that source data verification will very much change in uh, the light of a risk-based monitoring approach. And in the past, the investigator has very often delegated, you know, getting their files in order to the monitor. I think this puts an end to it. And of course, changes to source data should be traceable, so audit trail um, in paper and in electronic records, which brings me to the electronic records. And I think here, they're very much emphasize uh, the, the use of computerized systems that the integrity of data needs to be ensured, whether uh, systems are, should be validated, but also if you have an update of systems, they, um, you need to ensure that the data are not disturbed in any way. And I think uh, that brings me to an end with the update. So those are the implications, I think, quite enormous. And when you think that in about a year's time, maybe early 2017, that's approximately the time that we're looking at when this ICH addendum will be, become effective. There is not so much time anymore to you know, implement new procedures. And now I'd like to hand over to uh, Randy for 
the more practical part, not the theoretical one. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you, Peter. Uh, and thank you in particular for that illuminating uh, insight into the changes which are now going to confront us in the near and not so near future and uh, basically pointing out those details because the document itself, if for those that have already read it or looked through it, is uh, quite comprehensive and consequently uh, it can be quite useful if, if someone like Peter is pulling out that information and, and highlighting it accordingly. So um, the second part of our webinar today is, is going to be uh, focused on essentially now that this addendum is in the, is coming and will impact our lives uh, correspondingly, how is it that we can deal with that uh, effectively and in particular since there's a, a large portion of that is, is uh, focused around a risk-based approach to quality uh, management. You know, what are the, some of the, the tools and approaches which have, have uh, proved to be effective in the past that we can then apply here and moving forward? And so, th having said that, what I plan on doing in, in the second half of the webinar is essentially to point out how uh, our existing technology uh, serves this purpose, how it, it, it addresses the various points within the addendum which uh, Peter highlighted, and in particular, as you can see here on this slide, uh, here are some of those key elements which are being addressed by uh, this technology. Um, however, due to the nature of the limited time today, I won't be able to go into all the points. So, for example, regarding the clinical trial design, uh, we have a risk assessment in place which addresses those aspects as well, but uh, I will be focusing on a, a different part of all of that. Uh, Claudia, can you go to the next slide, please? So, in particular, uh, I'm going to be demonstrating today our quality risk radar product, and uh, as such, it is a product which is doing more than uh, risk-based monitoring. It's, it's, it's taking the broader approach of effectively doing a risk-based approach to um, quality management and focusing on, on um, aspects uh, like study oversight and everything which uh, is within that, that range under that umbrella. And I will, when going through this, this, this demonstration, essentially take the, the focus of a study manager or the study management team in particular and how we can support the study management team with their work using a risk-based approach and, and highlight that accordingly. Yeah, Claudia. So, but before doing that, I'd like to uh, develop a common context here and before going into the actual use of the system and the tool. And I'd like to do that with this slide, essentially pointing out if we take a step back and look at uh, study oversight in general and now that we're taking a risk-based approach to that, then what we've done with, with our solution is to look at those key areas and those key areas essentially being up front before you even start the, the trial. You're obviously engaged in uh, writing the protocol. You're engaged in, in getting that protocol approved. And as uh, history has shown, as experience has shown, uh, to the extent that that is done poorly up front, then this generally translates into uh, things like protocol amendments, which in turn result in corresponding delays. Each amendment is well known to then mean that uh, we have to go back, we have to get this protocol approved once again, and if once that is in fact the, the case, then the sites need to be retrained. Uh, this takes more time. Uh, depending on the, the nature of the trial, it can be quite extensive, globally speaking. And so it behooves uh, the, the initiators of the trial to really do their best up front to avoid those sorts of activities. And that area, this whole planning phase of the clinical trial and a risk assessment is devoted to that. Uh, we call that the study quality risk assessment. And, and that is uh, addressing various aspects of that addressing um, risk uh, aspects such as 
uh, essentially the whole design of the trial, what aspects are associated with that as far as uh, setting up that trial, everything ranging from financial aspects to uh, uh, informed consent to um, looking at things like um, um, different aspects of, of working with certain vendors which could be involved, could have a, a new mix to the, um, the undertaking. All these things are then um, incorporated in such a risk assessment and would be involved and, and executed before one actually goes to the, uh, the IRB to seek approval and, and thereby increasing the, the likelihood of avoiding those uh, protocol amendments downstream. However, for today, we're going to focus on the, the risk assessment, which is dedicated towards an ongoing trial. So this is on this diagram focusing here on the, the actual uh, trial side risk assessment. It's telling you, um, you know, what and how well are your sites performing uh, based on what the protocol is, is telling them and assessing that risk and doing that on an ongoing basis. So there's regularity here. It's not a, a big bang approach where we take one risk assessment and that's the end of the story. Uh, quite the contrary, it's an ongoing process. Typically it's, it's done on a monthly basis. And based on those risk assessments, uh, the, you, the study management teams are receiving a, an updated uh, uh, risk assessment which tells them their degree of exposure throughout the, the trial. And based on those, those signals which come out of that, it is a natural input to adapting the various functional plans that you have coming to bear on such a clinical trial in any case. But in this situation, what we're doing is we're applying those risk signals to then adapt the, the functional plans uh, as appropriate as, and doing that in a very systematic way. And here down below in the slide is pointing out the various kinds of functional plans which uh, uh, could be impacted by this. As Peter pointed out, the monitoring plan would be, certainly be one key uh, functional plan which would be addressed with uh, this trial set risk assessment. And we'll take a closer look at how that is involved and how that uh, could be affected based on these risk assessments. All in all, when you pull it together, you, could, you have an, a corresponding integrated quality a uh, risk management plan which you can use from a strategic perspective when you're uh, carrying out your risk-based approach to uh, study oversight. So um, with no further ado, I would like to then transition into the actual demo and uh, let's go ahead and do that. So to make that happen, Claudia is going to pass the uh, control of the go-to meeting to me so I can then log on to the system and then give you a closer look at what's going on there. So show my screen. So um, looks like you can see my screen now. So what is the quality risk radar? So in general it's an application which is a web-based application so it's available in, any, uh, in most leading web browsers. Uh, I'm going to log on to the system and uh, the system will start off by showing you a, a dashboard and the dashboard itself is, is, is telling us a number of things. So first of all, what it's telling you is it's, it's a reflection of the, of the basic risk model which we uh, have implemented here and that risk model is, is essentially calculating three uh, essential quantities. It's calculating and first bear in mind that we're looking at the trial set risk assessment, so our risk entity is, is the site, and so it's calculating an overall risk for the, each site. Uh, beyond that, it's also calculating so-called structural risk of the site. So what is the structural risk of the site? These are the, the, site, the risks which are inherent in each site. So it's, it's saying and, and telling you things like um, does this site and its personnel have experience in GCP? Have they uh, any training in uh, GCP? Are they even aware of the fact that, that there's an amendment coming? Are they here at this particular webinar 
or not and the like? Uh, do they have experience, for example, in the therapeutic area which the, the protocol is engaged in? And, if, and these various aspects are then um, those risk factors contributing to an overall structural uh, risk assessment of that site. And that being in place, you, we then also look at, at, at uh, the site process risk. So how well are they executing the trial? So if you look here in the upper right hand, it's, it's giving you a flavor of that. It's in this example here, it's saying that in the dashboard, it's saying it's showing all the results of the site risk assessments for all the studies in the system. And in the case of the process risk, it's saying that these are the top three uh, key risk indicators. So these are, so to speak, the, the, the top three uh, offenders. So if we were then to uh, take a look here, we could see that you know, they're having primarily problems with protocol deviations, so they're not in full compliance with the protocol. If we looked out there, it's the, uh, beyond that, we have uh, a higher than average number of adverse events uh, going on here. And uh, we also have a significant contribution of, of risk associated with slow enrollment. So um, the original planned enrollment uh, rates are not being met, and that's cause for alarm. And this is giving you those first indication of that. Uh, here regarding trending, this is uh, simply an, an initial indication which says that, as I pointed out before, we're doing multiple risk assessments. And so this is saying that since the last risk assessment, the trend is either uh, moving in upward or, or downward. So the risk is either increasing or decreasing since then. And that's a reflection of that. Uh, additionally, and quite importantly, where it's not only about calculating risk and sh showing you lots of pretty pictures. At the end of the day, we want to make sure that we empower you to actually mitigate that risk. And uh, in order to, to make that happen, we have a other part of the system engaged in site risk, risk mitigation. This is a quick overview of, of all those particular risk mitigation tasks which have been created by the system. And giving you that overview, there's new ones here. Some are in progress, and some have been already worked on and closed. You can then drill down and take a look at that. We'll do as well. But ultimately, let's start by looking at the, the overall site risk and see what that's telling us. So here at the top, it's saying that, and this is what I'd like to point out, uh, our risk model is, is, is in full compliance of what uh, uh, Peter had just indicated here. When we do risk assessments, we always calculate risk relative to patient safety, as well as data integrity. And so you're getting the, the full information based on the two primary risks. So what we're seeing here on the dashboard is it's saying that relative to, to the 51 sites currently in the system, uh, it's telling you that regarding patient safety, things are looking quite well. Uh, we, most of it's in low risk category. 47 of the sites are looking quite well, but versus Looking at the data integrity there is where there's some problems to, that, that need to be, have, uh, take a closer look at. There we, and we're going to go ahead and take a look at the data integrity to give you an example of that. So now I'm playing the role of somebody in the study management team. This is my first view of the dashboard. I would then drill down from here to uh, get a better understanding of this. And since I said we're going to take a look at data integrity, that's in fact stay with that focus. And because I'm also a member of the study management team, then of course I'm working on one or more studies and we're going to focus on one of the studies. So I'll choose one of the studies out of the system. So I'll choose this study here. And so what is this telling us now? It says that for my study here, K023, uh, this study in particular is, uh, has, I believe, yeah, it has 32 has 32 sites in it that are already enrolling patients. Uh, initial overview here is just telling you, you know, where the sites are all located. Some are in, in the U.S., some are in Canada. Further downstream, you can see Poland, the Czech Republic, and so on. But uh, more importantly, what it's telling you is, is it's giving you the results of those risk assessments. In, in particular, it's giving you the results of those risk assessments of each site regarding data integrity. and these are those results here. So we're using a standard traffic light um, evaluation or presentation of those 
risk signals coming out. So you can see, for example, with regards to uh, Site 130 here in Canada, they have a, an overall uh, risk score of high, and um, that being the case, that would be a, a natural candidate with which you would consider looking into. And so as a member of the study management team, I could then, then delve down into this. I could, of course, uh, also filter here, and it would tell me all the sites which are at, currently at high risk with regards to data integrity. And so let's stay focused on 130. I'll drill down here. And now the, the system is essentially doing a number of things. So it's telling me for site K023 and site one, I'm sorry, study K023 and site 130, let's stay focused on, on, the, on the data integrity. It's saying that the overall site risk is high as we pointed out before. But just so you have a better understanding of, of what is, is calculating here, the basic structural risks, so there's risks that are inherent to the site, started off as a low risk, as you can see here. However, in the course of the trial, what we found out when we calculated those the process risk factors, or the KRIs, six of the 13 KRIs went beyond their quality thresholds. And due to this contribution of the process risk, the overall risk score was then evaluated to be a high risk. And um, as illustrated here in these graphics. And um, beyond that, I don't think we have so much time here today, uh, but here in the upper right, uh, just to give you a, a flavor of, of the underlying uh, risk model, is simply saying that when we went about to do these risk assessments, at the very beginning, we applied a methodology called the failure mode effects analysis, which essentially says, Let's look at the underlying process here and identify those activities or uh, modes which are likely to fail. And if they do fail, what sort of impact would they have on the organization? Um, how likely are they? And, and how, to what degree are we able actually to, to detect these risks? Uh, uh, and that combination of those three then are translated into an overall risk score, which we're looking at here. So, as part of this the study management team, of course, the question arises, you know, well, what are these process risks? You know, how can we deal with them? First of all, we need to know what they are so we can have that identification. And once we know that, then we can do what Peter had made reference to before by drilling down here. And now it's uh, going back to data integrity. It's then showing you that, you know, which ones of those six are, in fact, beyond their quality thresholds. That's what you can see here, and then listed here with the red signals. Uh, for example, one of them is lower than average number of adverse events or higher than average early terminations is, is two examples of that. And so right here, you already, from the get-go, you're giving or getting a, a direct uh, view of, of where the risks are coming from. So we're already seeing a, a targeted uh, approach to so those risks here, which you can then very naturally use to as a basis for going forward and doing uh, mitigation. But before we do that, let me just uh, pick out uh, a couple of these KRIs and give you a, a feeling for what it is that's being um, addressed here, what's being calculated here. So just taking the first one, uh, lower than average number of adverse events is what we're calculating here is essentially um, a ratio, but in particular what we're doing is we're comparing the number of adverse events reported at the site and comparing that to what's going on uh, at the country level. And, and based on that, we are then in a position to determine whether or not uh, they have some sort of outlier activity, some sort of unusual activity, which would warrant uh, further inspection. Consequently, the, the, the red signal here. And uh, similarly, if we look at, at, for example, higher than average early terminations, we have a, a similar result. But in this case, what it's doing is it's looking at the site and, again, comparing that result, how many early terminations do we have, how many dropouts, how many patients are, are leaving the trial. But in this case, it's, it's comparing it to the overall study as such. 
And we do this also in such a way that it's um, a normalized approach. So even though some sites or smaller sites have fewer patients, then uh, in order to properly compare these things, we, we normalize that. And uh, by comparing, for example, the number of AEs, it's number of AEs uh, per visit per site, and then it's number of AEs per visit per country. And then based on that, we can get a fair comparison. Um, OK, so that's been showing you the results at the study level, I'm sorry, at the site level, which, which uh, risks have been identified that have contributed to that overall high risk score. And so the natural thing to do would be say, well, what, are we, what can we do about this? And so what the system then allows you to do in the area of, of, of site risk mitigation, if we go ahead and navigate there, it's then, um, first of all, the system is set up and configured such that based on certain conditions or rules, it will automatically generate uh, risk mitigation tasks based on the, the risk signals which are coming out of, of the assessment. And in this case, wh what we're doing is we're looking at the site 130. So let's go ahead and, and uh, well, first of all, let's look at all the tasks. And let's look at site 130. We're going to filter on that. It's now uh, showing you, as you can see here, these are the six KRIs which went beyond their quality thresholds. So once again, we can see uh, what we were just talking about here, lower than average number of adverse events. Uh, uh, in particular, we have, um, so higher, higher than average early terminations, and so on. And so uh, this is then the part of the system which says, if I now want to take a look at this, and this is what's typically the case, so let's go ahead and drill down and choose higher than average early terminations. Then this is then the basis for a typical input to a regular review of the study management team looking at the sites, which I'm sorry, looking at the risks which came out of the system, this being one of it. And then this is where they would then engage in a root cause analysis. So as Peter had pointed out before, uh, this part of the system allows you to on the one hand, capture the results of those risks, uh, root cause analyses, and at the same time, classify those results um, so that they can be uh, reused later uh, as you move forward. But in particular, if we take this example, higher than average early terminations, the typical question which arises is, well, what was or what could have been the cause of this? So typically, it's either going to be due to medical causes or non-medical causes. Um, why are they then? Um, dropping out of the trial. If it were a medical cause, then I would also expect that uh, our key risk indicator would have fired, for example, higher than uh, average number of adverse events. In our example here, that was not the case. Um, so perhaps it would have been the uh, non-medical situation. If it were non-medical, then that would then indicate perhaps that the that the um, site management is, is inadequate, or perhaps they're allowing the patients to come to a visit and wait for hours on end to just to get their medication. And after a certain amount of time, the patients are throwing up their hands and saying, no, thank you, um, um, not for me, and are not coming back, or what have you. In any case, the, as far as the system goes, as an example here, I would come in here. I can assign this to myself. Dave, uh, what it's telling me now is, is the system also, and this is another aspect which Peter has made reference to, it has a full audit trail in the system so we can track whatever changes are made to the underlying data as such. So I mean here we're simply doing an assignment here. I'll just keep it simple. It updates that I'm now assigned to this task. And now um, I, being a member of the study management team, would then record the results of our root cause analysis here. So in the example I've just provided, then it's, it could be the case that the um, system's also telling me to keep using the QRR. Um, the, so here we record what is, in fact, the root cause. It could be one or more of them. Uh, based on that result, we could then record that here. 
Here could be an example of uh, resources lacking insufficient resources, as I gave for the argumentation. Um, you know, one person was on sick leave. Um, and then, you know, wh or what are you going to do about it? Again, these are a listing of uh, results of this uh, an failure mode effects analysis which came out of it. What are the typical reasons which are resulting here? In which case you may need to have, do a site follow-up, essentially assign somebody to this, to have Mike do that, and essentially, uh, you know, talk to site management and ensure uh, adequate resources. And of course you need to plan this. This is very urgent so we're going to only give them by the end of the month. And off you go. Okay, we updated root cause and mitigation action. And this is then the basis of moving on. So. If we now move back to the overview, it's showing that here. So it's saying that, oh, okay, for this risk which came out of the system, we now have a, assigned it to somebody in the team who's going to track that. It's in progress, and uh, we this is something which then goes about, and then the system will allow you to to do this. These these tasks here are natural inputs for um, various. Uh, functional plans have come to bear on the various risk areas that one calculate with and um, that's uh, pretty much what I wanted to cover today for our brief demo of the system. The system itself um, does uh, significantly more than this but um, I think this uh, gives you a, a good overview of, of that so if I were to um, come back to, to here or, or the site risk in, in general. Uh, you know, I think this would probably be a good opportunity to field some questions uh, regarding the demo, regarding what uh, Peter had to say, and uh, Claudia, were you, did you receive some questions in the meantime? Uh, up until here, we have not received any questions to that uh, demo or to that uh, outline of Peter. So you please feel free to enter any questions you have. In the meantime, I think we can then go back to the slide. Mm -hmm. And Randy could continue with his um, presentation on how to get started. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Claudia. So, um, obviously, one of the first questions which arise is, you know, how to proceed? How do you get started with all this? So, if now that this addendum is coming up, now that the the international community is expecting you to engage in a risk-based approach, uh, what are some of the tried and true ways of doing this and doing it uh, effectively? Um, what I have viewed here is uh, the ways that we recommend what we've done in the past and have been successful. On the one hand, you can, uh, as indicated here, go to a website and essentially register for our so-called Try Me application. You can then try it out for yourself. It has data loaded into the system already. That's uh, not a problem. You can immediately uh, get a a feeling for how the system is working, what it's doing for you by doing that. We've already we've done the demo today. Uh, there's other aspects which could be demonstrated as well. That's a possibility. But the most important way of getting started is is really very much about piloting the, the approach. So to really know how this works and how it works well for you and your organization, uh, a pilot project is quite warranted here. Here we uh, um, do this uh, typically with our clients. Uh, we sit together, we, we present our standard approach for piloting. This is then typically um, configured to the, the needs of the individual clients and the point and objective of such a pilot project is very much to say given our data, given our situation, um, let's do a test run, let's, let's, let's pilot this 
and get experience with the approach on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, the, the underlying system or technology to make that happen. Uh, this is very much about a data-driven approach. It's, it's making this a risk assessment uh, objective. It's making it very systematic and can be applied across the board. And at the end of such a pilot project, you then are in a, a, a position to decide how to proceed. Typically, one proceeds then by then scaling out, uh, essentially bringing in more studies into the system and proceeding uh, onward uh, as such. Um, Claudia, can you go to the next slide, please? So uh, in conclusion here, uh, in terms of our outlook, I just want to mention a few points. Uh, we uh, have a next webinar also um, planned, uh, in particular a webinar which is uh, focusing on um, what we on something called uh, spiometry key risk indicators. So what is that? It's what we discussed today was. Uh, in particular focusing on operational risk. So those risks which are common to essentially any clinical trial moving forward. And uh, we also have the capability to then focus on, on therapeutic area specific risk assessment. So be it oncology, be it biometry, be it uh, other areas that you may be focusing on as your particular organization. Uh, that's also applicable here and this would be addressed in the next webinar. And uh, beyond that, the uh, upcoming new release of, of our system is going to be available by the end of November uh, and it's, uh, with the new analytics and user interface in its entirety. And so, uh, and that being the case, I'd like to, uh, if there are no other questions, no, there are in fact a, a question came in from uh, Dimitri. Uh, Dimitri was asking, how do you set the thresholds for action? So, uh, good question, Dimitri. Basically, the, the, uh, the system, uh, as in order it to be quite adaptive, is, is designed such that we, you can configure those, those um, quality thresholds. So we have an interface which uh, allows us to do that. Um, I could uh, log on to the system and, and show you that again. But in general, it, essentially when we go into the so-called reference data of the system, we have the key risk indicators defined as metrics and within that we have an interface which allows us to change the, the various thresholds as appropriate and, and that flexibility is available. All right. Yes. No further questions until now. Okay. Um, good. So, uh, in closing, I would just like to thank everyone for their time today. Uh, we are glad to be able to share with you the, some of our insights into the uh, addendum as well as how we can support you in moving forward with those changes and how they impact you. And as usual, we try to both provide you with uh, a theoretical uh, basis as well as a, a practical means of moving forward and with those two then generally you're uh, in a good position to be successful. So um, once again, thank you very much and I look forward to um, talking to you later and otherwise have a good day and goodbye. <laughs>